Okay. My name is Felicia Davis, and I'm an associate professor at Penn State University. And I teach in the Stokeman Center for Design Computing. And I'm here today with with Vernel Noel. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Vernel Noel, assistant professor in computational design at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, and I'm also uh, a member of the Arcadia board, as is Felicia. Um, and so today we're going to introduce um, the award for te the teaching award for excellence. And just to tell you a little bit about the award, the Acadia Teaching Award of Excellence recognizes innovative teaching in the field of digital design in architecture, particularly teaching approaches that can be adopted by other educators. Today we have the honor of awarding Terry Knight the Acadia Teaching Award. So to give you some official introduction to Terry, Terry Knight is the William and Emma Rogers Professor of Design and Computation in the Department of Architecture at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where she's taught for the last 25 years. She conducts research and teaches in the area of computational design with an emphasis on the theory and application of shape grammars and making grammars. Her book, Transformation in Design, is, well, is a well-known introduction to the field of shape grammars. She has published extensively on grammar-related topics in design research journals and books and co-edited computational framed journal issues. Terry Knight's current research explores what abstract, formal, and discrete computation can tell us about the active, sensory, and temporal nature of making. She holds a BFA from the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design and an MA and PhD in Architecture from the University of California, Los Angeles. Terry Knight serves on the editorial boards of the Journal of Mathematics and the Arts, Design Science, and Design Studies. She is co-editor of the Rutledge book series, Design, Technology, and Society. So I'm delighted to be here um, as a former student of Terry Knight and want to say a few personal things. The quality that makes Terry Knight an exceptional teacher is her approach to design and computing. Our first conversation about design computing got me thinking beyond the end result and onto the process of computing and what that might mean and thinking about making. So I appreciated the discipline that Terry brought to the questioning and at the same time appreciated her profound openness. Um, I knew Terry first as my advisor and teacher, then as a model for computational design research, writing and pedagogy in our field. As an astute scholar who acknowledges the person you are, and who asks questions that push you to think about computation in ways that connect who you are with possibilities for the field, Terry Knight is literally one of my favorite people in the world. Without further ado, we are honored to present the 2023 Acadia Teaching Award to Dr. Terry Knight. <laughs> You're gonna talk. I'm going to talk here. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> My heart is thump, 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 thumping. <laughs> Thank you, Felicia. Whoops. I'm trying to push this down. Thank you, Felicia. Thank you, both of you, Vernell, for those wonderful words. I, getting this award was a total shock because honestly, I really don't think about my teaching very much. 
And when I got the email about the award, I've told people the story before. I thought it was a hoax. I thought it, I thought someone was fishing for money. <laughs> um, so I put the email aside and then I looked at it a few days later and I recognized some names and I wrote to Leslie. And Leslie confirmed that yes, it's genuine. Um, so thank, whoops, thank you. Thank you again for that double, doubly wonderful um, introduction. And before I say anything more, all the credit, 99.9% .9 of the credit for this award goes to my students, my wonderful, great students. So please clap for all of them. Many of my students past and current are actually sitting in the audience and I've had the pleasure to reunite with some people from long ago. And thank you, Joseph, for calling me your old professor. I will reciprocate by saying, yes, you are one of my old students. <laughs> um, anyway, let, let me get started. Hold on one second. Okay, so um, let me make sure I'm going in the right direction. Okay, so um, I have a short time to talk. So what I thought I'd do is talk first a little bit about myself and my work and where my work is coming from. And actually, Felicia, you gave a nice hint about what is really important to me in my work, and we'll get to that. And then I'll talk about my teaching. I was asked to write a teaching statement as punishment for getting this award. <laughs> um, so I'll talk about my teaching principles as, as well. Um, so I thought I'd start with a bit of a nod, an homage to a great teacher, Paul Clay. Um, my academic career started off uh, with a degree in the fine arts and, and design, and a person, an artist who inspired me then and who continues to inspire me, whoops, sorry, is Paul Clay, the artist Paul Clay. Um, I keep on going back to Paul Clay for different reasons. I keep on making discoveries about my work um, and my thinking by looking into his writings. Um, I'm sure that you know uh, who Paul Clay is. Um, he uh, was one of the, the founders of abstract uh, non-representational art in the first half of the 20th century. And um, initially I was attracted to Paul Clay because of his artwork, because I was an art student. I loved his paintings and I loved his drawings. And then I started digging into his writings and his philosophy about uh, creative production and his thoughts about teaching. Um, and what I was especially intrigued by was his kind of a dual perspective on art and design. His perspective was expressive and intuitive and evocative, almost spiritual. But at the same time, it was very kind of clear cut and exact, and almost scientific. And um, at the time I was um, a, an art student, art and design student, I was introduced to computation. And I knew that computation was something that I wanted to pursue. Um, but I had a hard time reconciling my interest in kind of the formal, the rigorous approach that computation offered with my continued interest in kind of the evocative, the expressive, and especially the visual aspects um, of design. And Clay seemed to me to offer a way to kind of reconcile those dual interests a way to imagine uh, and think about computational design from a formal and rigorous uh, perspective, but also intuitive and evocative. And this is a very nice quote from one of Clay's books that captures this position. He says, uh, we construct and keep on constructing, yet intuition is a great thing. You can do a good deal without it, but not everything. Exactitude winged by intuition is at times best. And uh, many of Clay's lecture notes um, and ideas were collected in, in books. Um, probably many of you are familiar with the pedagogical sketchbook. This is a short track based on his Bauhaus teaching. And there are two larger volumes with, I think, probably 
all of his collected writings um, and lecture notes. And out of all of Clay's writings and ideas, what I have found over time to be most relevant to my own work <coughs> is his kind of overarching emphasis on process. And thank you, Felicia, for mentioning that because I wasn't aware that that was something that's that you would have noticed. Um, his overarching emphasis on uh, uh, on process and on what he also called becoming. So he kind of championed um, a philosophy of design that prioritized becoming, something becoming as opposed to static being. Um, and he writes here, form is set by the process of giving form, which is more important than form itself. Form must on no account ever be considered as something to be got over with as a result, as an end, but rather as genesis, growth, and essence. Form is the end, death. Form giving is movement, action. Form giving is life. These sentences constitute the gist of the elementary theory of creativity. And um, Joseph's work this morning actually was a nice example showing form giving. <laughs> so thank you for that. So viewed through this kind of clay-like lens of becoming or genesis or growth, and process, a key starting point and kind of a motivation for my own work is actually not this question, what, what is that? What is that thing? What is that work of arch architecture or design? Instead, the question for me has always been, how is that? How did that come to be? How did that happen? I'm a how person. Someone shows me anything like Joseph's work, I see these beautiful artifacts and I say, wow, those are beautiful. How did you do that? I wanna know the how part. And of course, answering this how question means a focus on process and on change and on time and an active carrying out of some process. So uh, computation is by definition a process. A computation involves time, it involves change, it involves carrying out some process or actions. Um, a Turing machine, uh, one of the earliest models of formal computation, carries out a process in time. Computer codes are processes carried out in time. So computation naturally embodies the how. A computation is the, is the how. However, most computational theories and technologies and methods um, usually prioritize the what as opposed to the how. They're often not, they're often geared towards getting particular results or particular answers um, or ends uh, with whatever means works, works the best. The how is often of limited interest. It's sometimes black box, it's invisible and you can't see it. Um, one exception, of course, in the world of design and computation is shape grammars, and <clears throat> a recent adaptation of shape grammars called Making Grammars, and these have been the focus of my work um, for the past several years, and my teaching as well. So shape grammars are generative rule-based systems. They're used to compute things, uh, either designs or real-world things, so they do compute the what. <laughs> they do give you the what, but a central ambition of shape grammars and making grammars too from the start has been to expose the means and not just supply the ends. So they follow very much in the spirit of Clay's theories of becoming. So the aim of these grammars is to kind of unveil the how, to make the how visible. And what makes this possible is that the rules and the computations of shape grammars and making grammars are visual, they're spatial, you can see them. Making grammars um, in particular were developed to express and understand the processes or paths to material forms, physical forms, and the rules are meant to encode the knowledge and the know-how of the maker. And Vernelle Noel's work is a great example of that, her early work on wire bending she produced a making grammar. It wasn't called a making grammar back then, but that in effect was what it was. Her rules actually showed how craftspeople do wire bending. Um, so there the 
the challenge was to figure out how to represent the how, the how part of wire bending. I'm sorry, Brunel, I don't have a slide of your work. We were all subjected to submitting slides three weeks early, <laughs> including me. And I did think of adding one, but it was too late. <laughs> um, so uh, shape grammars and making grammars prioritize or center the how in both retrospective and analytic studies like the one you see here, and also in, in original and creative, whoops, I'm falling behind here, uh, original creative design projects. So this image is from a very early shape grammar project uncovering the how of Frank Lloyd Wright prairie houses. And what you see here diagrammed is the how, the path to a Frank Lloyd Wright prairie house or how, how a prairie house is computed. And Clay aptly calls this kind of work the analysis of Genesis. He, he writes here, one particular kind of analysis is the examination of a work with a view to the stages of its coming into being. This kind I call the analysis of Genesis, the coming into being. Um, here's another early analysis project. This was a PhD project analyzing the uh, Malaguerra housing project by uh, CISA. And CISA worked as a partner uh, with a student, PhD student in this project. And CISA was actually interested in learning more about his uh, implicit design rules and design process. And he specifically asked Jose Duarte, who was the author of this work, tell me how I did this. How did I do it? Um, and he wanted an answer to that. And Jose gave him that in part. Uh, this this is a very different project by a student who was an avid rock climber, and he used grammars as a way to understand the how of rock climbing. So he knew what rock climbing walls were, he knew what they looked like, but he didn't understand the how of them until he developed a grammar and rules that showed the how. So even as an experienced rock climber and you know doing this rock climb, climbing over a decade, he really didn't know how these how these walls were made, and he discovered a lot just by coming up with the with the rules for them. And this is a, a very kind of hot, hot off the press <laughs> project um, from one of my classes by a, a project by an MARC student who was interested in water towers. She loved water towers. She'd been collecting photos of water towers from all over the world, and wanted to under, understand more about the compositional and the structural how of water of water towers. Whoops, I'm running behind, I'm sorry. There's the water tower project. And shape grammars have also been used in original and creative design projects. Um, they've been used to compute new results. Um, new things, but just as important to understand the underlying how those things came to be. And this is a project, a student project for lighting units. The rules compute flat patterns, which are then folded to make 3D designs. And the student writes here specifically that his interest lies, and I'm quoting from, you probably can't read the text at the top, um, the unexpected results that emerge from the transition, in other words, the path, from flat to three dimensional. So he's explicitly interested there in the, in the what, I forget what, how, how Clay phrased it, coming into being, the coming into being of these lighting units. Uh, another short design project, this was from early COVID days in an all Zoom class, which none of us want to remember too much. Um, so this was a student project for floating houses in Southeast Asia. And the student's inspiration was twofold. Uh, one was existing floating homes that have a dual functionality with uh, living spaces above water and at water level uh, markets. And he also took some cues from local indigenous uh, bamboo structures. And here you see on the left, just one of the rules underlying the project. And on the right are computations for different stages in the development and detailing of the project. 
And here are some visuals of the final outcome, the what part, um, a floating structure that rises and falls with the tides. This was another very inspiring project. Um, so more often than not, student pr projects begin with figuring out the how of some existing body of work that they really admire, and then using that as the starting point for their own work. This is a project in the arts, uh, also an MARC student, um, and she was a fan, a big fan of the work of the Brazilian artist Ligia Clark and her famous B shows. B shows translates as creatures or critters. And these B shows are kinetic structures, kinetic sculptures. So they're meant to be variable and participatory, experienced in different ways. They can fold and unfold in different configurations. And the student's explicit interest was in like, how do you make these? How did, how did she make these things? They're so wonderful. How, how did they make, how did they come to be? Um, so on the, on the left, you see some of Clark's original critters. And on the right are some of the rules that the student uncovered, illustrating the how of these different creatures. And here's a computation uh, showing the how, the step-by-step -step how of one of the original critters. Um, it generates, the rules generate a flat folded piece, which then can be unfolded into different configurations. So she figured that out, which was great, a, a wonderful discovery. And then, of course, the student used the same rules to compute a completely new critter, which she named Bisho, Do I'm going to mispronounce it, Doce, uh, translates as sweet, sweet critter. Okay, so now on to my teaching more explicitly. Okay, so most of the student work that I just showed comes from a course that I've taught for many years, which some of you in the room have taken, um, and it's called Visual Computing, and that brings me now to my teaching principles and my statement that I was asked to write. Turned out to be a very illuminating exercise for me. Um, the visual computing class um, is open to students from any program or department, graduates or undergraduates. It's part lecture, part hands-on work, part uh, project-based. And um, I also teach another course on a regular basis called Inquiry into Computation and Design. I know some of you in the audience are currently taking this class. Um, and this is a required class for new students in the in the computation group. But again, it's open to other students. The inquiry class introduces um, different computational approaches and ideas, mostly based or well, not mostly partly based on the work of uh, our computation faculty. And I also introduce uh, a lot of the history behind computational design to give students some grounding for their own work at, at MIT. OK, now on to my teaching principles. So I cooked up seven teaching principles, uh, which I don't always follow, um, and I'll outline them briefly now. So um, to start, here is one of my core teaching principles, mostly for my visual computing class, but to a lesser extent for the inquiry class. This is one of the first things I tell students. I didn't always tell them this, but I discovered it's a useful thing to say. Suspend your disbelief. Um, I tell students, like, put aside any suspicions or disbelief that you might have about what you're about to hear because it might sound far-fetched. Like when I tell them, this is a class about computation, but we are not going to use computers. So I say that a few times, but always at the end of the class, someone will come up and say, well, what programming language are we using? Like, no, we're not gonna be doing that. <laughs> Um, I, I, so I, I tell them just temporarily put aside any incredulity you might have to engage with the material and the value of the class might not be apparent to you until the end of the class or much later, or maybe never, um, you never know. And interesting, interestingly, it's often those initial skeptics or disbelievers that come up with really great projects because they're really questioning, like, what's the point of this? So they come up with some pretty great ideas. So I, I've had to sp suspend my own disbelief about some students too at the, at the beginning of the class. Yeah, so students who come to my class, visual computing class, are most familiar with this type of co computing with numbers or symbols, in other words, programming or coding. 
And the kind of com computing I introduced them to with shape grammars looks nothing like this. Shape grammars were invented many years ago. They were unusual then. They remain unusual today. They're unusual in terms of what they look like, how they work, and, and the kinds of things that you can do with them. Uh, so I tell my students that they are going to be the computers, that they're going to be computing with their hands and with their eyes like you see here. This is one of my PhD students figuring out the how of favelas, informal settlements in Brazil. So here he is at the board trying to figure out the path to favelas, which look they look very informal and unplanned. But in fact, there are some pretty clear rules underlying the development of circulation and the placement of buildings in, in a favela. Okay, here, whoops. here's a, something I'm very famous for in my <laughs> inquiry class. Uh, so what? Okay, this is actually a question. Um, and it's a tough question that needs to be asked all the time when you're doing research. I ask myself this question when I start on a new project. You know, I ask my, quest my students when they present their work, or work of someone else, one of the first things I say is, so what? Why should I care about this? Like, what is the problem you're trying to solve? Why would anyone care about it? Um, uh, why? What would motivate someone to suspend their disbelief and continue to listen to you, uh, you know, about what you're, what you're proposing? Um, and in a few minutes, I'll show an example of the so what question and an answer in a student project. But moving on to number three, um, the toolmaker's paradigm. And anyone in my inquiry class is also familiar with the toolmaker's paradigm. I start off the class talking about this and it's, it's really important, especially today in today's world. So for those of you who have never heard of this, the toolmaker's paradigm is a really radical model of human communication that was introduced by a linguist in 1979, I think. Um, and his name is Michael Reddy. He's famous for this one paper and this one paper alone. It's one of the most cited papers in academia. Um, and he presented uh, the toolmaker's paradigm as a critique of a very pervasive and misguided conception about the nature of human communication. And Reddy called that the conduit metaphor. And he described both the toolmaker's paradigm and the conduit metaphor in this early 1979, I think, paper. The conduit metaphor, which Reddy critiqued, looks something oops, like this. Make sure I'm in the right slide. So the conduit metaphor likens communication to taking thoughts from our heads, <laughs> our thoughts or ideas, putting them into a box represented by words, sending that box to a recipient, to a, a listener or a reader. And the, the recipient, all the recipient has to do is unpack that box, take out the message, the thoughts and ideas, and voila, everything is preserved intact. And the recipient knows exactly what the sender meant with no effort. And what Reddy showed is that this metaphor is constantly at work in our everyday use of the English languages, of, of the English language with sentences like, I gave Vernell uh, that idea. I just gave it to her and she got it, or maybe she didn't get it, or she tried to put her feelings into words, or my lecture is getting across to you, or not getting across to you or I'll, I'll take questions from the audience when, the, when this is over. So that's, that's, that's the conduit metaphor at work. And what Reddy argued is that the use of this conduit metaphor in our everyday language profoundly and wrongly affects how we think about communication. It leads to conflict, it leads to unfulfilled uh, expectations. It leads to blame when we're misunderstood or, or when we don't get what someone said. Um, so by contrast, Reddy presented uh, his toolmaker's paradigm, which you see pictured here. And that assumes that 
successful communication is really hard. Um, it's not immediate and it's highly effortful. So this is his diagram of the toolmaker's paradigm where he's showing or picturing people or communities living in different pie, totally separate pie-shaped pie segments. They have their own environments. They have their own tools. They have their own ways of working. And the only way they communication happens between people in different segments is through the central hub, passing notes or drawings back and forth from one segment of this wheel to another segment. And in this picture, communication is only successful through many, many back and forth exchanges of notes and diagrams and drawings to arrive at some kind of mutual understanding. So what Reddy is essentially saying is that we each inhabit our own social, cultural, personal environments or worlds. We each have our own tools or ways of working and thinking and living. And we have to work really hard with back and forth dialogue to arrive at mutual understanding, mutual trust and mutual meaning. And of course, this is especially relevant today given the recent events um, in our world. I assume the toolmaker's paradigm in teaching, or I try to. I have students from all over the world. Whoops. I have students from uh, all over the world. Uh, they come with different uh, life experiences from different cultures. And in order to create an environment that's equitable and inclusive, I work really hard to try and understand and respond and respect um, the different perspectives of my of my students to see their ideas and their their intentions and their and their work as they see them. Okay, four is have a point of view. So perspective taking is really important, but it's equally important for an instructor to have and to express their own point of view. Curating the work of other people is not enough for learning. So students learn from. Uh, an instructor's singular point of view, whether they agree with it or not, at least it's the starting point. And at MIT, this is my personal criticism, or, or it's not a criticism, but just to take it, MIT and may probably elsewhere, we have an increasing number of classes that are lecture guest lecture based. Um, they're very educational and they're entertaining, but they don't have the same learning potential and impact as an instructor based class. Um, so that's my, my op-ed. <laughs> Five, uh, copying is good. I know I'm not alone and maybe I am alone in promoting this. Copying is learning. So copying or reproducing someone else's work is a really powerful way to understand that person's work and then build on it. So for my class projects, especially in visual computing, I try to get students to copy from each other you know, to take a peer's grammar that they really like and make it their own and build on it, it never works. It hasn't worked in 25 years because, you know, our culture celebrates individual originality and, you know, uh, but I keep, I keep on encouraging it. But, you know, students won't copy from each other, but what they will do is start a project with precedents from outside of the classroom, right? And uh, as a way to get ideas and then develop them further. Um, and here's a nice example of that. Um, this is a student project that began with and was based on copying. Uh, this was a short project that explored joint details for construction. And uh, the problem that the student uh, outlined uh, is here. This is also an example of the so what question that I talked about a few minutes ago and an answer to it identifying a problem that other people will care about. So Inez writes here, in the most conventional practice, architects use detailed recipes, assemblies of predefined ingredients that organize generic solutions to, to generic problems. In this case, there is no time to think of new solutions or new solution spaces. The detail is already defined from a catalog. There is no need to design a detail at all. And then she uh, continues uh, saying here, and here's really the problem that she's looking at, what happens when you have a non-generic problem or situation? In that case, that architects will need to customize and invent non-generic solutions. And as an answer to this 
so what problem uh, of non-generic situations, the student explored uh, a new possible solution, a computational one using shape grammars. Um, so she first looked at existing examples of joint details. Here's the copying part, uh, both traditional and contemporary examples. And she also, we well, can't see this, probably has um, listed example applications of each one of them. And then she defined rules corresponding to each one of the existing details. So she's just copying what's out there and making a rule for them. And then um, she explored kind of mixing and matching her new rule, her rules in different ways. And she was able to compute very quickly many novel and new non-generic uh, interlock details. These are 3D prints of some of her computed interlock designs. And then she uh, continued the work in her master's thesis, and I think also in her PhD work at the, at the ETH, um, integrating or trying to embed physics into the assembly, the how part of assembling uh, interlocking components. Six uh, is collaborate, construct, and slow down. Um, so I, prom I promote collaborative, active doing and making in my classes. I know many instructors do that too. Making tangible public artifacts for discussion and conversation is really key to, to learning. And again, I know I'm not alone in promoting this. I also promote slowness. So in my visual computing class, students practice unhurried, reflective, by hand shape calculations in class to develop a really meaningful and kind of rich understanding of the how computations, the how, the how of design. So computers do not have a central role in this environment. Um, students are the computers, the, the slow computers. And here is an example of slow visual computing somewhere apart from MIT. This is an image uh, uh, from some field work that one of my PhD students did in Indonesia. He looked at traditional wood carving in Indonesia, uh, trying to figure out the how of what they were doing. And he worked with local craftspeople using shape grammars to explore and to extend traditional methods. So here they are with their hands and their eyes down on their knees uh, with tracing paper, working out wood carving details, computing, actually computing wood carving details with, uh, with grammars. And my last, my last and most important teaching principle for me, for all teachers, for all students, have fun. <laughs> and we do have fun, I think, in my, in my classes. Um, and, and Thank you all very much. I would, again, like to acknowledge all of my wonderful students, some of whom are sitting here in the audience. Really, thank, thank you all very much. Um, thank you very much for the honor. No, here, one, two. Hello. Yes. Um, thank you very much. Congratulations again, Terry. We have uh, time for maybe one, one question. <laughs> I think everyone is thinking through those seven points very deeply. <laughs> okay, we have, we have one question here. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much for the great presentation. If we can't be your student, how do we benefit from your thought process and all that? <laughs> <laughs> That's a very nice question. <laughs> thank you for that question. Um, I, I, don't, I don't really believe in online learning. Sorry <laughs> about that. Um, although so, I think I was forced to do it at some point at MIT. So there's some stuff on our original courseware, I forget what it was called, and open something or other. 
some people here know what it is. Oh, what was it called? No, not MOOC. Anyway, there's some there is something on the MIT website, I think, that has uh some of my stuff. And I also put together a lot of notes and slides for a new school in Dubai, a Dubai School of Design. I don't know where those went, but I did document everything at one point. Um, so you'll you'll have to come to MIT as a visitor. <laughs> and I would love to have you in one of my classes. Thank you. Um, thank you, Tammy. Thank you very much. I think we're on a little break now. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much.